third lecture. Um, this is one of my favorite lectures. It's language and identity focusing on gender. So before we get started with our lecture, I do would like you to um, watch these videos. Um, they're from Harvard Sailing Club. I don't know if that's actually the sailing the sailing team or not, but um, it's pretty funny. Um, I'm not going to play them here because I do upload my videos on YouTube, so they kind of strip away any any type of uh, copyright violation if you try to upload a video, but um, I think they're very funny, and then they also kind of speak a little bit to um, the kinds of gender performance, right? Um, so there's one um, featuring mostly male-identifying cast, and then there's one featuring a mostly female-identifying cast cast and and the humor here comes from how they're able to um, switch gender roles so please do go back and watch them they are kind of funny uh, while you're doing that uh, make sure to ask yourself some of these questions so you know what are some of the characteristics characteristics used to describe men um, and how they speak and what are the characteristics used to describe women how true are these stereotypical characterizations? Um, you know, what are some things that you align with? What are some things that you found were really funny? Um, and, you know, to what extent do your personal behavior are consistent with these stereotypes? So, um, you know, the fact that the males are, you know, gathering around trying to imitate females talking about their bodies versus, you know, the females kind of revolving around sports, um, you know, they do have some basis in truth. So, um, you know, let me, you can also post on the discussion board, you know, your thoughts about, thoughts about these. Um, and then later we're going to talk about non-binary gender, um, and kind of, you know, breaking away from the male-female paradigm. So some of the male characteristics you probably saw in the video, um, probably had to do with some of these adjectives, right? That, um, to be male in, uh, you know, predominant, um, in our society means you have to be aggressive or proud or confident or funny, you know, or ambitious, right? Whereas some of the female characteristics are emotional, talkative, sensitive, moody, right? Um, they try to make everyone happy, right? The female in the video, you know, um, or the, the female characteristics that the males were portraying in the video talked about, you know, trying to make sure that no one had um, any object, objections to them going out to dinner before, right? So these are some stereotypes, obviously, you know, um, people deviate from stereotypes all the time. Um, and this is not to say that, you know, females have to be this way or males have to be this way. Um, this is kind of culturally uh, the performance of gender. And so when we talk about gender, we really want to um, separate uh, sex from this, biological sex. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about um, transgender and cisgender. Um, but sex, when we talk about sex, we're talking about the biological differences between a man and a woman. Um, you know, this could be your sex uh, assigned at birth. This could be, um, you know, the primary sexual characteristics. Um, this is very different from gender. Gender is something that's socially constructed. Um, if you want to read more about this, highly recommend um, taking some of the women's gender studies classes at UMBC or reading works like uh, Judith Butler or um, Audre Lorde um, and, and, and uh, some of the literature that kind of focuses on the uh, practices of being feminine versus masculine. Um, so when we talk about gender roles, they're kind of, um, you know, what's expected behavior and what happens when we violate those behaviors. And so there's um, some social consequences that come from uh, not being able to act within um, your gender roles. Um, it's important to remember though that gender is learned. Gender is taught, gender is enforced by our culture. Um, gender is collaborative, so it's not accomplished by independent action, which means that um, no one says like males are this, right? But it's a kind of a group response. Um, a group of people determine what a gender is. And so um, and we see in different cultures how, for example, um, in India, there's there's a third gender. Um, and that is um, totally fine. There's places in Thailand where it's also, you know, transgender is perfectly accepted. Um, different religions also accept different, um, different genders, right? So gender is something that we do. It's something that we perform. 
children do gender quite consciously. Um, I don't know if you've been to um, a quote-unquote gender reveal party. Hopefully it didn't turn um, into something dangerous. Um, but this is, you know, right before birth, people are assigning gender even before you're born, right? So before you're born, they said, oh, you know, it's a boy or it's a girl. And they'll go out and they'll buy um, pink or blue um you know, uh, dresses and, and, or they'll buy a suit or they'll buy, you know, a certain color crib, right? So gender is something that's even a sign, um, you know, that, that's something that is ascribed to you even before you're born. And then also important to note is gender is asymmetrical and that equality is built into gender at the very basic levels. And we'll see that, um, in a little bit with some examples, um, in language. So in English, there are terms that refer to both genders, and they're always masculine. So um, this is what we talk about when things are marked, right? And so if they're unmarked, it means that the language um, kind of defaults to this term. So if someone is, um, we'll say this person is an actor, or this person is an author, um, that in, you know, in English, we automatically think of this person as being a male, unless we say, you know, they, this person is an actress or this person is an authoress, right? This, or a female author, you know, I love to see that. Um, I'm being facetious here. You probably can't see me, but you know, these are terms that mark, um, uh, females as being different than males, you know, so these terms are never applied to males. No one would say that they're a male actress or a male authoress, right? Um, and so adding the, the terms like S or saying you're a female nurse or a female um, doctor, these have um, not only implications as far as, you know, it, it marks the language, but also has a negative connotation in that they're lesser than. Um, something like an actress is, is lesser than a, an a actor or an authoress is lesser than an author, right? Um, if you look at the um, Academy Awards, you know, which award comes first? And so some of the ways in which language encodes gender um, are some traditional terms, right? So um, if you're able to refer to someone, um, you know, by their title, you would say, oh, mister, right? Um, and it doesn't really matter whether or not the uh, person in question who um, is identified as a male um, is married or not, right? That does not matter to them. Um, but it matters as far as, um, you know, whether or not you are referring to a female. Um, so people would say, oh, or should we call you Miss or should we call you Mrs., right? And it wasn't until the 70s, the 1970s, that this term MS came about as kind of a neutral term um, to say, hey, like we um, as women, we're not, um, our term of address doesn't matter um, uh, you, the, our, our, our marital status actually does not matter in our terms of address. That is when you were referring to me, um, as Miss Chong, right? Professor Chong, um, it should not matter whether or not I'm married or not. Right. Um, but you know, before the 1970s, it was very, very common. And so we see this in other languages. Um, for example, uh, Mademoiselle, right. In French, Madame and Mademoiselle, and, um, you know, or senora and senorita, right? And so, you know, I've asked uh, my students before in, in the past who spoke other languages, like, you know, oh, you know, why are you calling me um, senorita? Because, you know, clearly I'm older, right? And they'll say, well, you're unmarried. And so I say, so if I'm 60 years old, you'll still call me senorita? And they'll say, yes, because you're unmarried. So there's still some kind of gender encoding, um, and you know this is not to say that Spanish or French are the only languages to, that do this because English does it as well. Um, there's also been a long history of transmission of surnames that follow um, men. So you know um, the fact that uh, in societies such as um, United States and also um, most of the Western world and parts of Asia like Japan. We take on the last name of our um, husbands if we're women, right? And um, so that's that's been kind of uh, you know it's it is kind of a gendered role um, or a convention. And even for those of 
who are unknown gender or generic gender. So you might be reading textbooks that say like, um, a person must return to his seat, right? Instead of a person must return to his or her seat um, and naturally defaults to the masculine pronoun. So this is what we're talking about when we say that there are um, power differentiations in gender. So, um, you know, a lot of linguists would say that this is sexism um, in that, you know, looking at the terms here um, that they put the more powerful entity first, right? And it's usually a male. So when you think of things like master and servant, doctor and nurse, mother and child, husband and wife, right? You wouldn't say things like wife and husband. But there's an exception, ladies and gentlemen, right? And a lot of linguists would say that um, that is a bit of a um, condescension, right? And that people think that ladies uh, deserve to go first. It's kind of like the Titanic uh, rule in which like um, mothers and their children um, get to go first on the lifeboat. Um, but, you know, decide if there's any differences between these, right? Is there a difference between the masculine form and the feminine form? So take examples like master, mistress, or uh, lion, lioness, instructor, instructoress, right? Um, you know, and then also look at the, you know, the terms in which they include a female, like female doctor, male nurse, male prostitute. So what is the, um, the differences? Are there positive or there negative associations? And can you describe what kind of morphological changes that mark these terms, right? Um, you know, then when it's marked, it's, it's probably because it seems to deviate from the standard. The fact that you have things called male nurses, indicates that most people would think that culturally it's more um, accepted that a nurse is female. And so you want to, um, you know, society says you want to um, import um, this, this term male nurse to, to, um, to create a difference here. And thinking about the patterns of negative and positive connotation, positive connotations, there are um, ways in which language has changed, right? So, um, someone who's a courtier or might be someone who's very different from a courtesan, right? Or someone who's a bachelor is very different from a spinster as far as, you know, what do these terms, um, how do they carry in modern society? So if we're looking at the um, kind of the history of these terms, a courtesan was someone who was a prostitute, someone who mostly is sort, you know, like a concubine, someone associated with men of wealth or someone who you know, had access to the king, right? Um, it literally means woman of the court. But you don't really see that, um, you know, being used for courtier uh, as much. The same thing for a mistress. While we could say something that's a master, like the master bedroom of a house, right? A mistress is something who, um, you know, we would say someone who uh, engages in extramarital affairs. We would not say something, oh, are you the mistress of the house, right? That seems that it's a very um, bad connotation, right? Um, so, so yeah, so the first, um, you know, this is the first definition of mistress, and it really kind of carries those negative connotations. The same thing for hostess, right? Um, a hostess is employed, it greets, regularly entertains guests, right? Uh, which might be different from a host. A governess is someone who um, is employed to take care of a child's upbringing, right? But we would not say, for example, um, you know, uh, the female uh, governor. Um, we would say a uh, governor. So if right now, um, you know, there's a female governor or there's a governor of South Carolina and she's female, um, but we would never call her a governess because that word dictate, um, or sorry, connotes um, something who, something more like a teacher, someone who's more uh, relegated to um, the home and takes care of a child's upbringing, right? Not, not fit to lead, um, you know, a state or institution. So the fact that governor governess is equivalent to a governor um, is kind of archaic, and it suggests here that we have an example of semantic deterioration, which means that like over time, governor has been upheld as this, the same term, but governess has really um, the the term has led to a very bad connotation. 
And the same thing for adventurous, right? If someone who's an adventurer, we'd say, oh my gosh, you know, they go to so many places. But if someone who's an adventurous, that might be someone who is、um, unscrupulous, questionable, maybe even sexually promiscuous. And、um, to give our last few examples, we have Madam, right? So I grew up in the South, and everyone, you know, you don't address to people as、um, their names. You say Sir, and you say Madam. But even Madam, even though it seems really polite, you know, you have things like the woman in charge of a house of prostitution is called a Madam. So, you know, what does this mean、um, in the power differentiations? I mentioned this before: the differences between bachelor and spinster, right? Where as someone is called the bachelor, you know, they have a show called the Bachelor, right? This is something that is.、Um, That is,、uh, you know, really、um, valued, right? Oh, you get to be a bachelor. You get to spend your entire life, you know, just being by yourself. This is something that's revered.、Um, you know, George Clooney, before he had、uh, married his wife, he was considered to be a lifelong bachelor, and people really thought that that was、um, something to be coveted, right? Whereas a spinster, on the other hand, is an unmarried woman, and it. You know, this is something that's looked down upon. They say, "Oh my gosh, she's unmarried." You know, her she will she her occupation will be spinning for the rest of her life because she'll never get married. And so, this is kind of the、um, the sexism that's kind of inherent in the English language, in which you see a lot of these examples of、um, women women. You see a lot of examples, sorry, of these terms that are mostly. Um, used to denote males in position of authority and power, and then the female version of these terms are used to denote someone who has lesser power, someone who has questionable means, someone who has to deal with、um, immoral, sometimes immoral means,、um, and so this is what linguists say when when they say that you know there's sexism kind of embodied into our language, and these these you know some some of these terms are still used today. So I'm going to shift gears here in talking about you know how women and men actually use language, right? So、um, women's speech is more used、um, in in into, intonational contours associated with poli- politeness and surprise. So women,、uh, this is early research in the 1970s, which looked at how women use language, and they said, okay, well, women are more polite in their language, right? And when they're talking, they usually say. Mm-hmm, right, as in as a back channel. So you're talking to me, and I said, "Mm-hmm," and this is my way of saying I hear you. Whereas men don't use "Mm-hmm," right? They use things like "I agree," right?、Uh, they use more,、um, you know, f- full sentences. And so this is this is、uh, kind of the differences that were first chron- chronicalized in the speech differences between women and men. Uh, Robin Lakoff.、Uh, Lakoff is a、uh, um, you know a very acclaimed linguist who looked at the differences between gender and language, and、um, you know some of the things that she looked at women's speech、um, were some assumptions. So, for example, hedges. So, you know, women didn't say, "I know," you know, this happened, right? They would say, "Well, you know, I think," or you know, "I'm not sure," or. You know this might be wrong, or this might sound like a stupid question, but right? They use super polite forms and certain tech questions like,、um, "Yeah, it's a great day outside, isn't it?" Right? Or,、um, "Yeah, aren't you going to you're going to store, aren't you?" So tech questions are kind of、uh, used to、um, as a form of politeness, but it's used as a way of、um, kind of getting the other person to、um, clarify what you mean. Um, in case you're wrong, Lakoff also said that women spoke in italics and that they emphasize particular words,、um, that they use more adjectives than men.、Um, and then also, you know, what she found were,、um, as far as I think this is supposed to be men's speech, but or sorry, no, no, it is women's speech. So women would use hypercorrect grammar. You know,、um, they would say、um, someone and I instead of someone and me. Um, direct quotations. They would quote from other people. They would use more specific lexicon and question intonation. A lot of people would say、um, at the very end of their speech, right? They'll have some something more of an up talk, where each line sounds a little bit like a question, like kind of like I'm doing now, 
right? So this is what um, Lakoff would say was typical about women's speech, and they and she also said that it, they uh, women avoided expletives, coarse language, right? Because that was very um, more masculine in form. Women's speech were also um, tied to gossip, right? Um, in talking about other people. And she said, is this meaningless? Well, you know, it is a form of bonding, right? They said it was a way of women to talk about their uh, roles and um, talked about their style and um, particular to a certain topic or setting. Now, Deborah Tannen is also another linguist who kind of focused more of her career um, on gendered speech. So she also noticed six contrasts in the way that women talked and the way that men talked. She said there was status versus support. So men would have more of a status role in which they are talking to uh, maintain their superiority versus support. Like women would, um, you know, when someone would say something to them, they wouldn't try to debate it or they wouldn't try to um, have any sort of status symbol. They would kind of support what the other person was saying. Independence versus intimacy. So, um, you know, men would kind of uh, talk about their um, topics as a form of uh, independent thought versus, you know, this they're not talking as a ways in which to relate to um, to other people. Advice versus understanding. So Deborah Tannen also talked about how um, when women spoke to each other, they weren't necessarily wanting some advice. So oh, she noted that a lot of women would get upset because when they would talk about a problem, like, oh my gosh, my boss was really rude today. Um, you know, the male partners in their life would get upset because the, they would offer advice. They would say, well, have you considered X, Y, Z? And that's not really what the women wanted. They wanted more of someone to understand them. She also discovered that men were more into um, gathering information uh, versus feelings, orders versus proposals, um, and then conflict versus compromise. So that's what um, kind of the main speech components, uh, differentiations she saw in between two genders. Um, and I kind of, uh, you know, talked about this here, but, you know, men would talk in a very assertive way. Um, they would take longer turns. So a turn is when you are, um, linguists use these, discourse linguists use these terms to switch. Like t my turn is, is when I'm, I'm taking the floor, um, and taking the space and talking, right? They have short openings and closings. Most of their speech uh, revolved around sarcasm, they're teasing, they're joking each other. Sometimes they use curse words, they use strong language, and it's very adversarial. So if you watch the YouTube videos at the beginning of the lecture, you know, they they constantly try to, um, you know, the women that are trying to imitate male speech, they were, they were challenging them, right? So it was like men trying to challenge each other. Whereas the women use language in a more social facilitative way. They try to understand people, they try to get their um, their ideas across, and it's very cooperative. They took fewer, shorter turns, so they interrupted less. Um, they elaborated their openings and closings. They used stories, but it, it was, they used humor in a different way than men, in, in which men would use humor in a mocking tone, whereas women would use more anecdotes. They would use more funny stories, and they would go into these elaborate details. More the emotional language, more the hedging, like I think, or, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, right, kind of words. Um, and they were also very supportive and very polite towards each other. Coates also, uh, you know, replicated some of the, the studies that Tannen did, and she looked at kind of the simultaneous talk, right, um, and used the tag questions to interact sensitivity, right, to um, try to understand what the other person was saying or to, um, as a way of back channeling. Um, Coates also figured out that women were more, overall more attuned to the face needs of the listener. So there's more than just language. If a person's coming to me and they're sad, you know, they have this wretched look on their face. Um, uh, women are more, more, um, you know, attuned to, to kind of what the other person was, was looking at rather than just what they were saying. Um, and also by face, it's, it's, um, it could be, you know, whether someone looks, looks, um, a certain way, but also if they have certain dignity or prestige. Um, so for example, if, um, two women are talking and, um, you know, 
it's it's very clear that one of them doesn't want to um, talk about a divorce. Women will kind of shift around the subject to not talk about it, right? So this is kind of their um, their attention to faith, their attention to their people's dignity and their prestige. Zimmerman and West looked at interruptions, right, and found that men interrupted uh, more often than women. Um, in seeking to dominate the talk, right? So they did a study in which they recorded a conversation between men and women at their community college. Um, and during this time, as older academic studies always did, were people who went to college. So people who went to college in the 1970s are mostly white middle class individuals who are under 35. So, you know, this might be very different from today, right? But, um, you know, this is kind of the the times in which they were, were doing research. And so here's an excerpt. A woman says, how's your paper coming? The man says, all right, I guess. I haven't done much in the last two weeks. The woman says, yeah, no, how I, that can't, you know, and while the woman is speaking, the man drops and says, hey, you got a cigarette? And the woman says, oh, yeah, sure, and hands him a pack. Like my, and then the man says, how about a match? And the woman, the man's interrupting her again. The woman says, um, here you go, like my, and then the man says, thanks. The woman said, sure, I was going to tell you my, and the man says, hey, I really like to talk to you, but I got to go. See ya. And the woman says, yeah. So I don't know if you have um, witnessed this in your life, but uh, yeah, this is um, kind of, you know, the they would count the times in which uh, the woman would take a turn, right? The woman would be speaking. She has the floor and she would get interrupted by a man. Again, this might be very different um, in today's terms. And so, you know, these are um, different different avenues, right? So it's not only that men and women speak different ways, but they speak different ways in different um, in different avenues, in different situations. So in formal public talk, we're talking about, um, you know, how politicians, how performers, how they are, a- you know, aiming to inform or persuade people. Um, spoken by people who wish to confirm or claim some sort of degree or public status, right? Um, this in these formal settings, they found that men dominate talking time. So this could be some place like a workplace setting. The men would dominate committee me- meetings and staff meetings and seminars and task oriented groups, right? Um, and so the perception is that in these meetings, it's their way of asserting status, asserting their power. So this goes back to um, Deborah Tannen's find, findings in which um, men are speaking to, um, in you know, to to gather power, to enhance their status, and to kind of evoke a sense of you know, I know what's what I'm doing, I know what's going on. However, when they looked at private context, um, there's there was a, a little difference. So there are a few differences between men and women in talk time. Um, this highly, you know, highly. Um, divulged from the kinds of behavior in public settings, right? So women were more likely to talk in relaxed social settings. Um, They're more agreeing and supportive and encouraging, right? Whereas men contributed more information uh, and more opinions. But as far as the talk time, they're very similar. It's just how they talked in private settings uh, was very different. Social confidence. So um, typically, if you know more about a topic, you're able to contribute to a conversation than someone who's unfamiliar, right? Um, so they did a study which they compared the time that spouses talked between each other, and they found that males dominated in couples with traditional gender roles. Um, that's not surprising. But the women, they spoke more if they were confident in what they brought to the conversation, um, so for example, if I'm in a, a lecture and there's something about linguistics, I'm more able to talk more prominently about it than if it's something about biological sciences. What about this notion that women talk too much, right? What is, what is this, um, stereotype, right? Um, so talk serves different purposes as we know. Um, it's the kind of talk, it's the social situation, it's the familiarity between the two people, it's the social confidence, do they know a lot about their topic, are they familiar, right? So what does this mean by talking too much? Do women actually talk more than men? And the research finds that men do talk more than women in formal and in public contexts, but the women talk more in private and informal interactions, especially if they're confident about their subject material. Um, 
and there's lots of different research about, uh, you know, kind of how the men talk versus how women talk. And I definitely encourage you for your discussion board posts to kind of look at the research um, and to see whether or not that's changed. I am more apt to believe that the more, um, you know, the more women you have in, in um, different fields, the more women you have in corporate settings, the more women you have um, in colleges and universities and as professors, you know, maybe this dynamic has changed quite a bit. I do want to shift gears to talk about non-binary gender language because we did talk about uh, binary quite a bit. And I want to um, show this video. Um, this is from a linguist. Um, and they talk about, you know, the kinds of non-binary uh, language and the use of pronouns and why um, throughout time, you know, the use of thou transformed to you. So, when a lot of people say, well, you know, we've been using he and she for ages, like, why can't we continue to use he and she, right? Um, well, you know, this linguist talks about the kinds of implications that has um, in culture and in language and how that shifted throughout the years. So very great TED Talk. Highly recommend it. Please watch this um, and you can give your, your um, opinions on the discussion board. And um, I'm not going to go over um, kind of the history of, uh, you know, gender and non-binary, but again, it's very important to kind of point out um, these terms when talking about uh, gender identity versus gender expression versus, um, you know, sexual identity and biological sex, right? So gender identity can be, uh, you know, as a spectrum, um, you know, versus, uh, you know, you have things like... Um, how people in your head define your gender based on how much you align or don't align with what you understand to be options for that gender, right? And the options might be changing. Your gender expression could be the ways in which you present gender through your actions, dress, demeanor, and those could be representations interpreted based on gender norms. Your biological sex is something that um, the characteristics that you're born with and develop, including genitals, your body shape, your voice pitch, your body hair, your hormones, your chromosomes, right? So um, these, these, you know, are very different, but they're very um, important to kind of consider the, um, the implications it has, especially in language. And so biological sex, I kind of talked about at the beginning of this lecture, but it's depending on physical characteristics, right? Um, and many transgender people prefer, prefer the term assigned sex at birth because it recognizes that sex is assigned by others. It's not necessarily what they identify as or what they, um, what they express themselves as, right? It might be very different. Your gender identity is something that's a psychological sense of yourself, um, and it may or may not coincide with their biological assigned sex. So some people identify as neither male or female, um, or they might identify as both male and female. So they could use queer, they could use gender queer. Um, you know, some cultures have gender categories in addition to male or female. They could have a third, a third gender, right? Um, some Native American cultures have a third gender. And again, at the beginning of the lecture, I said that gender was a social construct. I named in many ways in which we're socialized from a young age, right? According to our assigned sex, but also in the ways in which language. Um, also, gender expression is, you know, any of the mannerisms, personal characteristics that serve to communicate a person's identity and personality as they relate to gender and gender roles. They can be present in people of any sex or gender identity. Um, and again, like we said, it's culture specific and you'll figure out through the rest of the lectures how closely aligned culture is with language and, and vice versa. It's a trait that reads either male or masculine in one culture. Um may be seen as female or feminine in another. So, you know, there's certain, it's it's very culturally, um, societally, you know, engineered based on, based on, um, and it's, it's like we said at the beginning of the, the series, um, it's very arbitrary, right? There's nothing specific about, um, you know, an activity that uh, denotes it as more, you know, as masculine or feminine. We just assign these certain um, gender expressions to them. And an individual's gender expression may vary from day to day or from one social context to another. 
Sexual orientation refers to emotional, romantic, or sexual desires that someone might have. Some of these could be gay, lesbian, heterosexual, bisexual, pansexual, asexual. There's numerous other um, sexual orientations that a person might have. So the video kind of talks about, uh, the TED Talk kind of talks about the use of pronouns and why the use of pronouns is important. Why it's important to ask people for their for the use of pronouns. You know, um, there's lots of different arguments on the internet um, about diff using different pronouns and and why um, this might be um, important to someone and why you should ask. You know, if you don't, if you're not sure, um, you know, I would say. 10 times out of 10, that person will not be offended if you ask. Um, they probably would be offended if you use a pronoun that they uh, do not see them as or, um, you know, do not express as. So these are examples. It could be, you know, she, could be he, could be he, could be him, could be they or them, or could be uh, they or here. So these are ex examples of um, singular they pronouns. They're, sorry, singular third person pronouns. And consider the ways in which we see uh, cis normativity. So, uh, you know, cis is something uh, that means like you are um, not only assigned uh, the um, gender that you expressed um, at birth. Um, so you're assigned a gender, but also you you identify with that gender or you align with that gender. So talk about the ways in which you um, see cis norm normativity in social interactions. You know, so. These could be gendered clothing or bathrooms. Um, but, you know, someone could come up to you and say, you know, hi, ladies, right? Um, and if you don't identify as a lady, right, this is something that a lot of um, people uh, might take issue with because it is not something that they align with, right? So language can have a very important component um, in, in making sure, you know, people feel the way that they um, want to feel. So um, these are some some gender inclusive languages, right? Um, and so we, as linguists, we really advocate for gender neutrality. Um, we advocate for forms of language that's not biased towards a particular sex and social representation. So what we mean by that is, um, you know, if the gender of the person is unknown or indeterminate, we want to um, include people in our speech. So instead of saying things like, hey, guys, we would say like, hey, folks, right, or hey, people, right? Um, or if someone says um, in the video, um, they said something about like, if I had uh, my parents had three sons, like now they have um, two sons and a child, you know, so. Um, you know, all, always good to ask um, and to use more inclusive language. Some of the challenges um, to using gendered inclusive language include, um, you know, gendered language. Um, gendered language often implies male superiority. We already talked about that in the PowerPoint. Um, but some people always have to say, well, at least an unnatural grammar, right? Like, it's very hard to say things like, everyone must return to their seat versus his or her seat, right? Um, but, you know, this is something that's uh, more commonly accepted as time goes on. I know, for example, some of the reference books like APA or MLA, they're, they're more used to accepting the use of third-person singular, they, um, you know, to refer to um, he or she. So, so I, I think as time goes on, we'll we'll be able to use more gender inclusive language. So, I want to give you some examples of how to use gender inclusive language. And um, you know, I don't play video games, but I know that a lot of you play video games. So, if you do, please put what video games you play on on the message board and maybe on the discussion board. So maybe your um, your you know, classmates can join, but so, um, you know, video games, we kind of see them, um, as a, a sphere in which, you know, um, originally the player's gender was unknown, but now all of these, you know, games come out where you can kind of pick and choose, um, you know, how to express yourself. Now, a lot of people, you know, have non, they have non-binary characters in video games now, which I think is great video games are kind of leading the charge in this this way right and so i have some like old examples i'm sure you have newer examples that you can put on the discussion board but for example the sims right they have a they started having a flexible creation menu 
um, in 2016, so you can really, uh, you know, kind of change whatever custom gender settings you wanted to do. Very, very, um, you know, kind of forward-seeking during this time. There's a game called Fall in London from Fail Better Games, and they had an option of a third option in character creation. So they asked, may we ask whether you're a lady or gentleman? And you could say, I'm a lady or I'm a gentleman. Or there's another option where it says, my dear sir, there are individuals roaming the streets of Fall in London at this very moment with the faces of squid. Squid! Do you ask them their gender? And yet you waste our time asking me trifling and impertinent questions about mine? It is my own business, sir, and I bid you good day. So... Very forward thinking in this time, like these creators, you know, were were excellent. Um, the same company made sunless games, and they, you know, asked them for a preferred form of address. So they, you could be a madam, you could be a sir, you could be a citizen, you could be a captain, you could be my lord and my lady, right? So they, they, you know, like I feel like if they could do this in video games, I don't know why it's so hard to do in real life, right? To say like, oh yeah, like what do you prefer to be called? So, um, you know, how are there ways in which gender inclusive language can be used? So instead of using policeman or police woman, we could use police officer. Same thing for stewardess. I don't know a lot of people who would use stewardess from now on, but this used to be the term for flight attendant, right? Some people would just say flight attendant. They wouldn't say stewardess, right? Or steward. Um, instead of using he or him or she and her, they would use they and them. And then they could, uh, you know, they could duplicate structures by saying actor and actresses. Or they could restructure the sentence and saying, when you're a little boy, and you could say, in your childhood. Um, instead of saying chairman or chairwoman, they could say chairperson, right? So I've, I've heard ways in which um, they could use more gender inclusive language. Um, and other languages are also, right? Um, consider other, you might be learning some of these languages and then, and then you're noticing like it's very difficult for you to use masculine forms or use uh, feminine forms because you're not really sure, right? Well, you know, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Russian, they've, they've included some of these um, gender inclusive language. So French use, uh, they created a neuter or inclusive language adding gender endings, right? Um, Shetties, Amis, Russian, they have avoided constructions using gender endings, impersonal or plural verb forms, no solution to accommodate for gender fluidity, well, you know, maybe in the future. German, they use the word asterisk to, uh, they use asterisk to indicate variations, so like der, d, producer. Spanish, they'll use an at, um, an x or an e to replace uh, at or o, so use, instead of being Todos, they could use, you know, todas, using the at symbol, um, todes, right, or the x. Um, in Italian, they use the word, the asterisk to replace a or o. So instead of um, bambino, they could use bambin, an asterisk, right, or an at to indicate plural, ragazzi, ragazzat, right. So, um, yeah, there's different ways. And, you know, I think with the creation of internet, I think with the creation of, you know, these video games that I don't play, but maybe you play. Um, there's multiple ways in which we can be more inclusive in the future. So here are the discussion questions for this week. What does gender performance mean? What are the ways in which men or women could perform gender? Can language be considered sexist, right? Is the English language considered to be sexist, inherently sexist? Why is it important to ask people for their preferred pronouns or why not? Um, and in what avenues have we seen more inclusive video games being used? Like the internet, for example, or video games. Um, and if you have other questions related to uh, gender, you can definitely post that on the discussion board as well. Um, have fun. I look forward to your responses. And I'll see you on the discussion board.